and I'm going to let people in. Great. Go for it. Mary, just give me a shout when you've let everyone in. I'll get started. Mm -hmm. um, everyone should be in the meeting. Yep. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Holly Fernandez Lynch. I'm the co-organizer of the Research Ethics and Policy Series along with Steve Jaffe. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Matesh Patel on the topic of using nudges to improve the delivery of healthcare. Um, as a reminder, the REPS lectures continue to be recorded and we post the videos on the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy website. As soon as they're ready, Mary can post in the chat the link so you can find previous recordings. Um, and we expect to continue to host REPS remotely for this semester, um, hoping uh, that perhaps we'll be able to be in person again in the fall, but we will see. Um, let me just make a couple of quick announcements before I introduce Dr. Patel. Um, first, you can see on this slide here that the full 2021 slate of rep sessions is available. Um, and you can find out a bit more about the topics that each of the speakers will be covering on our department's events page, which Mary Pham uh, will post as well. And then please note that we've decided to start requiring registration. You, you've already figured that out because you, you needed to register to attend this session. We're going to keep doing that um, as long as we are online to minimize the chance of any further unpleasant Zoom incidents. And then um, let me just... I just wanted to flag again a couple of other resources from our department. We have um, a, a compilation of videos and other resources on ethics policy and COVID-19. And we also offer um, a series of short research ethics courses that are available for free for continuing education credit. And our newest edition you can see towards the bottom here is on the ethics and regulation of social and behavioral research. We'll be adding um, a, a a lecture or two on um, vulnerable populations in research as well as global research. And with that, I just wanna thank our REPS co-sponsors for continuing to make this possible and Mary Pham for all of her logistics work um, to get you all together um, online with our presenters. So thanks Mary for that. Now I can introduce today's main event. Dr. Matesh Patel directs the Penn Medicine Nudge Unit, which is the world's first behavioral design team embedded within a health system. He's the Ralph Muller Presidential Associate Professor of Medicine and Healthcare Management at the Perelman School of Medicine and the Wharton School here at Penn. Dr. Patel is on the leadership team at the Penn Medicine Center for Healthcare Innovation, and he's also Associate Director at the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics, which you might know as CHIBE. He's a staff physician at the VA Medical Center in Philadelphia, as well as Associate Division Chief for Research in General Internal Medicine and Director of the VA Advanced Fellowship Program in Health Services Research. His research focuses on combining insights from behavioral economics with scalable technology platforms to improve health and healthcare. And he has led numerous clinical trials designing, excuse me, testing ways to design nudges incentives and gamification to change clinician and patient behavior. And we're going to hear all about this today when Dr. Patel will discuss the Penn Medicine Nudge Unit and share with us some examples of past projects and their ethical implications. There are a couple of kind of stopping points in the midst of the presentation and we can pause for questions then and we'll also have question time um, at the end of everything so if you have thoughts that you'd like me to um, share with the group please post them in the chat box and i can um, handle the q a that way all right um dr patel thank you for joining us let me stop my share and you can take over the slides great thank you uh, you hopefully should be able to see my slides now thanks for that introduction um so I'm going to give just a kind of a brief background on what the nudge unit is, um, what we focus on, and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, clinician nudges followed by examples of patient nudges. And specifically, I um, have 
uh, focus the talk on kind of highlighting the ethical considerations here, but I'm looking forward to the, the questions that arise from the group. Okay, so I always like to start with this. The premise of this work is that human behavior is the final common pathway for the application of nearly every advance in medicine, no matter how effective a medication, how protective a vaccine, or how targeted we can get a molecule, a therapy to be, really two things have to happen for it to translate into any benefit for patients. And that involves a dynamic between clinicians and patients. Clinicians need to recognize that a patient meets criteria for a test or treatment and then offer or prescribe that. And then a patient needs to understand what that means and then use it as directed. If neither of those things happen, let's say a clinician doesn't prescribe a medication or a patient um, doesn't fill or take the medication, then obviously it's not gonna translate into any benefit. Unfortunately, in healthcare, this dynamic breaks down a lot. Um, about a third of the time we think that we do too much. One third of healthcare spending is thought to be unnecessary, wasteful, redundant, makes you wonder why we're doing it. But on the other hand, a lot of times we don't do enough. Clinician patients will come in to their, see their primary care doctor or be admitted to the hospital and leave without ever getting offered evidence-based therapies or uh, other opportunities that, they, that guidelines would recommend that clinicians and patients should discuss before they leave. Two technology platforms, as you probably know, have expanded rapidly. They give us insight into these behaviors. So 90% of clinicians and hospitals now use electronic health records. It used to be that all of these decisions were made either um, through just communication, verbal communication or in pen and paper. And so it's hard to track exactly what was going on. But now everything's being funneled through the electronic health record. So we essentially can understand when a certain therapy or, um, is being offered or prescribed and then actually look at the patterns between outliers and understand what's going on. We can also introduce interventions into the design of electronic health records. There's a lot of information, a lot of ways that choices are offered and we can think about what's the best way to tailor that to help guide clinicians towards the path that's most evidence-based. On the patient end, um, there's been a wide adoption of mobile devices. 80% of adults in the United States now have a smartphone or essentially glued to this. Um, they get communications through this, now do virtual visits much more rapidly than, much more at higher pace than they were doing before. And this gives us an opportunity not only to understand their behaviors by using um, data collected from the smartphones to understand how active they are or how much they're communicating with their friends and family, but also to intervene through traditional methods like telephone calls, but also through newer message, through methods like secure text messaging or patient portal met methods. And so given these two platforms, a lot of people have wondered, how do we introduce nudges to be able to change people's behavior? Well, nudges are subtle changes to design that can have an outsized impact on our behavior. They're typically meant to remind, guide, or motivate our decisions. So some examples, and I'll show you examples of all of these things in the healthcare context, would be setting the default. This is what happens if you don't make a decision. Set that to the preferred option. Prompting someone to make an active choice now rather than waiting for them to make that decision or realize that they need to make the decision. And then because there's all kinds of information that's put through in electronic health records and patient portals, how can we frame that better to be more motivating, either by increasing transparency, let's say through the costs or prices of tests or treatments, or by using social co comparisons to help physicians or patients understand when they're outliers from the norm. It's important before we go into talking about nudges in healthcare to realize that nudges already exist in many other industries. Um, here are a couple of examples that you've probably all come into contact with uh, and interfaced with in the past. Um, the first is from airlines, maybe not recently, but before the pandemic. Um, if you were booking a flight, you had, you know, let's say you chose your seat and you chose your route, make sure it's nonstop, maybe like a window seat, you go and enter your credit card number and then you go to hit pay and it says you can't buy your ticket because you didn't make this choice, which was, do you want trip insurance? This is called active choice. It's prompting you to make a decision. You can't actually book your ticket on any airline unless you say yes or no. Um, and the reason is that in most cases, you don't need trip insurance. Most flights eventually get to where they're going, um, even if they're a little delayed. If they don't, or if you're sick and can't make it, you need to jump through hoops to be able to get your money back. Um, but yet, insurance companies and airlines make a lot of money off of trip insurance. And so if they um, get you right at the point of purchasing the ticket to add on this $50 for trip insurance, that's oftentimes profit that they can collect um, and might help you feel better in the short term, but might not be useful for you in the longer term. Next example is from Amazon or retail more broadly. Let's say you're buying a pair of headphones. 
um, you picked out the model, you've read all the reviews, maybe it's Bluetooth or wireless, and then you go to buy it and Amazon says, would you like to buy a carrying case to take these headphones on the flight that you just booked? And they know that people who bought these headphones typically bought this carrying case. Sometimes they'll even give you a discount, dollar off if you buy both now, you won't get that if you come back later. Um, they're essentially bundle, bundling complementary items to try to get you to spend more right at the point where you're about to check out and make your purchase. Next example is from Netflix. In contrast to purchasing airline tickets, this is probably something we're doing much more of in the pandemic, um, which is watching these streaming episodes. Netflix wants to encourage people to binge watch and because that's good for their model because all of their episodes for an entire season are out right away compared to traditional TV where you have to wait a week for that. Initially, they started by introducing kind of a subtle nudge here, just kind of a you know, season one of uh, episode one of Breaking Bad, which is already an addictive show to start, if any of you have seen it, um, ends and there's a cliffhanger. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a teaser as to what happened, but not enough to really tell you what the resolution was. Uh, eventually, Netflix ended up changing the default, which was that if you don't do anything, the next episode will automatically play. And it used to be that you had 90 seconds to find your remote or make a decision. But now I think it's down to like six or eight seconds. It's like so fast that the next episode in most cases automatically starts playing before anyone can figure out whether they want to watch or not. And in the path of least resistance is to just keep watching. You could fall asleep in episode one, wake up in episode six, be none the wiser, because this thing will just keep playing. But none of these things were done on accident, right? These were all introduced in different markets compared to markets where they weren't introduced in A, B, experiment or a randomized clinical trial, if you will. And each of these companies found that these different interventions were good for their business models. And so then they decided to deploy them more broadly. Now, in any of these cases, we might be comfortable with letting consumers make decisions on should they buy trip insurance? Do they want to buy the carrying case for their headphones? Should I watch episode two of Breaking Bad? Uh, but when it comes to healthcare, the decisions are much more complex. Many times patients don't know whether or not they should get a certain test or treatment. They need to talk to the clinician or guidelines have changed numerous times over the last decade. Take breast cancer screening, for example. And so in these types of situations, we need more oversight into how we're applying nudges and because their impact, as you can see here, um, can be very large. And so the way that um, this has been dealt with in governments is to introduce the concept of nudge units, which are behavioral design teams. And they're meant to systematically test ways to improve decisions and change behaviors. The first was in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, which was dubbed or called the nudge unit, which is where the name comes from, launched in 2010 essentially as a two-year experiment, but quickly showed a lot of successes in that they were able to increase efficiency of the government paying, getting people to pay taxes on time, increase organ donor consent rates, increase charitable contributions. There are about 100 examples on their website of things they were able to do with really low cost interventions. Since then, nudge units have expanded all over the world. You can see an example here. This is from two years ago, so there are probably many more nudge units now. Uh, or three years ago, I guess we're in 2021 now. Um, the ones in pink are the ones in governments. The ones in blue are groups of smaller countries that have gotten together and said, let's form a nudge unit for our groups of countries. And then the ones in green are outside of governments. These are mostly um, financial uh, institutions like the International Monetary Fund. Um, but in 2016, we launched the Penn Medicine Nudge Unit, which was the world's first behavioral design team embedded within a health system. Um, the, the mission was really to leverage these insights from behavioral economics and psychology to try to steer medical decision making towards higher value and improve patient outcomes. This was a kind of a collaboration between CHIBE and the Center for Healthcare Innovation was meant to kind of bridge some of the rigorous work that CHIBE does with some of the pragmatic work that the Innovation Center does so that we could actually be implementing these things within, you know, uh, practice sites and hospital wards and other health systems, but then doing it in a way that was rigorous to the level at which we could publish it in a peer reviewed journal and would hopefully accelerate dissemination at other health systems. Uh, we have several roles. We advise clinicians and stakeholders on whether or not they should think, how they should think about using nudges if it's the right fit. We do a lot of implementation and partnership with clinicians and frontline um, uh, healthcare workers and also leadership folks. We evaluate everything that we do that's a core foundational principle and probably something that differentiates us from a lot of other groups that are implementing this type of thing. They're, if you think about your typical um, uh, health system technology group or information systems, they're implementing a lot of these things and may also be doing some evaluation, um, but we're evaluating both in the short term, which is usually three to six months, and then we follow all of these projects at least out to two years. And then we focus a lot on disseminating these works. We want to take things that work, 
that were implemented within a couple of practices or a, a one hospital and spread them. And then we want to make sure that things that don't work are turned off because we have a lot of um, bad nudges that exist in the system that were never evaluated and hence never turned off. And then we have a lot of good nudges that were essentially launched somewhere and then never took off and, and were spread elsewhere. So that's a key foundational aspect for us to, to work on. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about clinician nudges. The first half, I'll talk a little bit about patient nudges at the end, um, but more in the context of the health system. We also do a bunch of stuff on remote monitoring and how to get pa um, patients to behave more healthy, lose weight, take their medicines, be more physically active, but I uh, probably won't have time to talk about that today. Um, we've launched over 50 projects in the last couple of years across many different specialties. These are just some of the ones listed here. Um, we've grown the team. It used to be myself and a research coordinator, and we now have more than 20 people including postdocs, project managers, data analysts, um, um, and so on, research coordinators on the team, um, and work with various folks across the health system, as I mentioned. We prioritize opportunities that are the right fit for a nudge. Not everything can or should be nudged. Um, leverages scalable technology like electronic health records or, pay, or um, mobile devices, like I talked about earlier. And then we're looking to make a big impact. We're not looking for like single percentage point moves. We're looking for things that are like, you know, 15, 20%. And is this an opportunity for us to take this to 80 or 90% if it should be there? And in order to do that, we formed a multidisciplinary steering committee um, that represents leadership from clinical care, um, information systems, and then also experts in behavioral economics. Um, so this is the last background slide, and then I'll dive into some examples. This is kind of a framework. It's called the Nudge Intervention Ladder. Um, uh, I'll kind of walk from bottom to top here, and this will give you a sense of how I'll present some of the examples. As you go up, these nudges tend to be more effective, but they also tend to be more paternalistic. So the example here that's illustrated is um, how to promote cancer screening. So you could start at the bottom, which is not doing anything. This is just monitoring your cancer screening rate. That's obviously not a nudge. Um, you could provide information on education. This is also kind of you know, foundational, but not what we think of as applying kind of like the behavioral insights. So educating patients on the benefits of getting cancer screening. Um, if you get into kind of thinking about how would we motivate people, you could think about framing that information in a way that motivates completion. So this could be um, letting people know when they're outliers. Um, it could be thinking about ways in certain scenarios about using price transparency when tests are expensive and how they could be shifted to things that couldn't. Um, when we move from framing information to actually thinking about decisions, we call this prompting implementation intention. So this might be asking someone to pick a time and date to get breast cancer screening or pre-committing to completing cancer screening in a, in a timely manner. Enabling choice increases your options. You might make it easier, um, you know, self-schedule cancer screening, or you might prompt. So for example, you might prompt a clinician to, to order cancer screening when a patient's in the office with them. Um, to see if that um, forces them to make a decision now rather than waiting for the clinician to realize that the patient's eligible for cancer screening. And then at the top um, is default. So making cancer screening the path of least resistance. This might be something like automatically scheduling someone for cancer screening, but then letting them opt out or change the time easily. Um, so these are all different. The, the one that you use really depends on the context of the situation and the question in mind. And I'll, I'll talk more about that as we go through the examples. So I wanted to spend a moment talking about, since this is the focus of the talk, kind of some insights um, and ethical considerations. First, talking about IRB and consent. This is a common question that we get. These are things that are in, many times embedded within the electronic health record. Do they need to go through the IRB? So we take the approach of all of our work is reviewed um, by the IRB. When we started the Nudge Unit several years ago, we actually sat down and met with the, the head of the IRB and the team and kind of you know, told them what we were doing and the types of projects that we worked on. Um, and had decided that we were gonna implement, we were gonna put everything through the IRB so that if we wanted to do a randomized trial and publish it, we could do that, but also that we could leverage the expertise of the IRB to help us understand when we needed to do things like consent patients and clinicians and when we didn't. Um, many people see this as a barrier to implementing these types of things, but you know, we've gotten pretty good at it. I'd say our average um, review time for a patient focus study is like four weeks and for a clinician, one can be as low as a week, depending on what it is. Um, but obviously varies depending on IRB, how busy the IRB is. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the things that already happen, the changes that already happen every day in the electronic health record are not reviewed by the IRB. So we're taking an ex extra step here when we're introducing a change that we're gonna study to have it run by the IRB, whereas a new alert's gonna be implemented within the electronic health record probably this week. 
and the IRB are no ethical oversight other than the committee that's in charge. There is a governance committee that the health system puts in place to, to think about similar things. Those are really the, the groups of folks that are making decisions on is this the right intervention. Um, same thing with communications to patients. Some of these things are thought of very carefully and, and through with a lot of work and a lot of input. Other things are, are not thought of as carefully. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that. The need for, we found the need for informed consent, typically, you know, this is a general rule. It doesn't apply to everything. It varies by the type of project. And so if it's a clinician focused nudge, usually it does, usually it does not require consent. It does, we do send it to the IRB for review. And typically we focused our projects on ones that follow evidence-based guidelines. So we don't take on projects that are trying to nudge something that's not in line with what the evidence or not either national recommendations or department or health system guidelines would recommend. Um, and it's within the usual scope of the intervention. So if you're going to change, you're going to add an alert to prompt a clinician to discuss cancer screening with the patient who's eligible for that cancer screening test, that, that's within the usual scope of what's going on and typically would not require consent from the clinician or the patient to, to test that in some practices, but not others. Um, for patient-focused nudges, it really depends by a lot of things. I've listed the two things that have mainly been kind of like branching points for us, but there are a lot of other nuances here. So one is, um, and this is actually interesting, uh, it's something I've learned recently is uh, the delivery platform. So often if we're sending letters to patients, let's say we want to enroll them, uh, let's say we want to nudge them to get a uh, recent study we're doing is nudging people to get the flu shot. If we want to send them a letter to let them know, hey, you're eligible for the flu shot. Um, or let, actually, let me take a different example because I'll talk about this more later, is a statin prescribing. If you want to send them a letter on statin prescribing, um, let them know they're eligible and they should, they could benefit from a statin. Um, really don't need patient consent to do that. But if we want to send them a text message about that, we do. And for a couple of reasons, the text messaging laws are different. Um, text messaging is not completely secure, although um, letters may not be either. But um, yeah, I'll walk through this in more detail later in the talk. And then also the focus, if it's something that's general and related to something overall, like so flu vaccinations, everybody really is recommending to get. Um, and there's the consensus is typically that you don't need a consent to promote something like that. Whereas if it was something related to a specific medical condition, which really reveals that that person has that medical condition, in those cases, typically we, we do need their consent before we share that information, just to make sure it's them and that they're agreeing to get this through, let's say a text message as opposed to like a letter. Matesh, can I just ask a quick question if that's okay at this point? Sure, yeah. um, also just thinking about the audience that we have here, which is um, hyper-focused on research and ethics. Can I ask a more detailed question about what you were just describing? Yeah. For so those those kind of branching points that you just mentioned, they're not in the regs, right? I mean, it's not like the regulations say that you can treat clinicians differently when, than than patients. It's really about who counts as a human subject, right? And whether you need to get a waiver of consent or whether you're maybe not even doing anything that gets defined as research in the first place. So I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit more. Are you, um, do you find that you end up requesting waivers of consent from the IRB? Or is it instead that the board says, actually, we aren't defining this as research at all because maybe you're doing something in the electronic records or you know, there, there are lots of kind of nuanced ways, different paths for IRB oversight? Yeah, that's a great question. Typically, we're requesting waivers of consents. Um, we're randomizing you know, clinicians or patients to different interventions, and we tend to think of that as human subject research. Now, there have been a couple of times, and I don't know if this is Standard now, where the IRBs come back to us and said we actually don't consider we consider this not human subjects research, and I haven't really understood the reason why two very similar tests would be cons considered different. We've gotten that a couple of times, but in most cases, I would say we get waivers of consent as opposed to saying this is not human subjects research. Great, thank you. Um, this brings up another interesting point, Mel mention because this audience might be interested in it, which is relates to, you know, all of our studies are also all of our clinical trials are posted on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and clinicaltrials.gov only allows posting of things that are considered human subjects research. In the rare cases when we've gotten a study like this that uh, the IRB will say this is actually not considered human subjects research, we have a difficult time posting on clinicaltrials.gov, which of course when we want to publish an RCT in like a medical journal is like a requirement. Um, and so we've had to work a lot with clinicaltrials.gov and the folks here at Penn and other places to figure, figure out how to categorize our projects on clinicaltrials.gov in a way that meets the information that's necessary in clinicaltrials.gov, but also doesn't, you know, become a roadblock later on when we're trying to prove that we specified these things, you know, posted them online a priori. Um, that's been an interesting set of discussions. I'm not sure there's been good resolution around that other than those, these are very rigid kind of platforms and we have to figure out how to 
take the, you know, some of the IRBs are moving ahead faster than maybe the clinical trials that cover others are moving. And so the, there's not just not the range of possibilities on clinical trials.gov to, to list something that's not human subjects research, even if it's an RCT that we would want to publish, for example. Um, the last example here would be a patient focused study. Let's say we're offering someone an incentive or um, we're doing some kind of gamification. The way I think about these are these are more intensive. They either involve implications on economics, like we're offering them an incentive, or people's time. They're a little bit more burdensome than just receiving like one text message. It's like a daily text message for a year. Um, and those uh, we almost always, um, we always, always, we always consent patients for that. There have, we have had discussions with the IRB if there were low risk things that were, we could make a case for standard of care and we weren't collecting all kinds of other data um, then like from the like medical records or things like that, then maybe we could um, do that with a waiver of consent. Um, but if we're launching a large RCT and a five-year grant, then we always, always, then we almost always also collect medical records and data from the state on hospital admissions and you know, your other things from your phone. And so we, we tend to consent patients so that we can get all the data and do all these extra studies. It's, it's very rare that we, we don't do that, but that is a, there is an opportunity through our discussions for them to do that. The one exception I would say is when we're testing different recruiting mechanisms. And so in several studies, we'll randomize people to um, get opt-in or opt-out framing. Um, so for example, maybe for this population, if, if anyone's enrolled in COVID safe, which is the um, COVID-19 saliva-based testing program, that's a project that our team has uh, implemented with other folks at the university. We randomized in the beginning and they wanted to know how could we get people to sign up for this. And so we randomized people in the first batch, not everyone, but in the first batch to either get a message saying, hey, here, here's what COVID safe is. Here's what you can click here to enroll. Or we said, you've been conditionally enrolled in COVID safe. Um, click here to complete your enrollment. And there are different ways we could make that stronger or weaker. We could have somebody call you to get you signed up. Uh, we didn't have much staff effort available for that. So we used the, the weaker approach, which is just send you an email saying you're conditioned and enrolled. But that, that gets a waiver of consent. Because had we consented you, then you would have been aware of that and it wouldn't be able to tease out the, the, the effects of that as well as we otherwise would want to. The, the other thing that I think is important to mention is in some cases, feasibility is a challenge. So for example, um, a fellow in the past, Mina Cedric, implemented this randomized trial of price transparency for lab tests where we would randomize a lab test that showed prices in the electronic health record and the ones that didn't. And it's just not feasible. And there were like, I think 200,000 patients that were impacted. I mean, actually it's the clinician who's impacted, but then they order the test for patients. It's just not possible to um, consent 200,000 patients for that. And then also consenting the control group may reveal something and may cause them to have hyper, you know, more attention to that. Um, that was also in line with um, other usual practices. It's like multiple reasons to get a waiver and consent, but that's another reason we often apply for that. Any more questions on this before I move on to the examples or the background? So we do have um, have a couple of questions here. So one um, is from Steve Jaffe, um, but I actually I'm reading the chat now. He says, let's hang on to this for the end. So the other one um, is from Mohana Nagda and um, they ask, how do you see the use of nudges within insurance models? For example, HMO models that are incentivized to keep patients healthy and utilize their network of providers when needed. How can they use nudges to improve healthcare delivery and patient engagement? Yes, yeah, so I don't see it being, I mean, other than them being the, the deliverer of the nudge is a insurance company as opposed to a health system, I don't see it being too much different. I mean, they have a target that they're trying to change and they have existing communication channels. So, you know, probably most people or everyone here has health insurance and you've received a message from your health insurance company, an email or a text message. And there's all kinds of nudges that are baked into those and they could think about ways to better frame that information. Um, I don't know what the oversight is like at a health insurance company compared to a health system, but I would... I, at most health systems, they don't have nudge units yet. And so I would guess there's, it's, it's not um, as robust as it could be. But I, I think the same opportunities that exist with health systems probably exist with health insurers. But, but obviously, context is important. And you should think about who's delivering the information and then what you're trying to motivate, especially when you're, and then keeping the, and keeping the outcome in mind. If a health insurer is nudging patients focused on their bottom line as opposed to what's best for patients, that becomes a conflict. And so always keeping the outcome in mind and trying to align on that. Actually, I am going to ask Steve's question on his on his behalf and add to it, so because I think it's relevant to what you were just talking about with regard to the IRB issues. And the question is whether you have any experience where you were worried that getting consent, a requirement to seek consent, might have compromised the generalizability of the study in some way. 
And then, you know, my addition to that is if so, have you sought consent waiver in those circumstances or how have you, have you handled it? Yeah. Any, so the ones typically are the one, you know, so for example, the opt-in opt, -in, opt out that I um, described. Um, another one that comes to mind, this is one that Scott Halpern led, you guys might be familiar with, where um, different ways to set advanced directives for patients and either um, aggressive versus less aggressive and had you consented patients. Now in that study, actually, the, I believe the IRB actually made them go back afterwards and let them know um, that they were uh, that they had been randomized to this. And interestingly, people still stuck with the, whatever they pick, showing you that like, you know, defaults are really actually, even when you know that you're being randomized to something, defaults are really powerful. We did a, we partnered with um, Scott on a, we were doing a mobility study on patients who were being discharged from the hospital and Scott's group was testing um, different incentives. So zero, $100 or $300 to enroll in our trial uh, among other trials. Um, and that was a case where going into the room we ran, patients were randomized before you went into the room and then they were offered an incentive. Um, and then we saw whether or not they signed up and then the staff person left the room and then came back and told them, hey, actually this was just an experiment we ran um, and we ended up giving everyone $300. Um, so in the cases where it's kind of, you know, I, you know, there may be issues about, since some cases we're testing that, um, we'll actually reveal to them after we've run the test and, and we know that the outcome has kind of been implemented that they were randomized to the various different options. Great, okay, there's no more questions in the chat. So why don't we let you proceed with the presentation? Okay, I'm gonna go quickly because I'm realizing I have a lot more content than I probably have more time for. So maybe I'll just do a couple of clinician focus and I'll jump to the patient focus. So the one thing I think is really important at the core of this is we're already being nudged. Most people think of these nudges as new things that we're introducing. Um, and it's important to reveal to people that nudges already exist. And what we're trying to do is to better align those nudges with existing guidelines. So here's an example. Um, this clinician is trying to prescribe Coreg, which is a brand name beta blocker used to treat heart failure or high blood pressure. Is any good search engine, if you're going to, this is an epic, but if you're searching for Coreg, the search engine is going to find you the, the results that are best fit for Coreg. It also finds you the most commonly prescribed Coreg dose, which is 12 and a half. But what it's doing by default is it's nudging you to prescribe the brand name prescriptions, which are listed first, because this clinician happened to search for Coreg instead of searching for Carvedilol. Um, for years, pen medicine was last in the region in generic prescribing, worse than Temple, worse than Hahnemann, worse than Jefferson. All the peers, they tried going to outlier clinicians. They tried holding grand rounds. Um, nothing really worked. Continued to be kind of in last place, so much so that insurance companies were essentially, um, uh, you know, weren't getting our bonuses for, for, for this metric of not hitting generic prescribing. So the internal medicine group or the division of general internal medicine actually tried implementing a change, which is if you search for Coreg, it would only show you the generic well, or any drug, it would only show you the generics. And you'd have to click this database lookup here to see the full list. Um, family medicine didn't implement this. And this was done when I was a, a fellow um, in the clinical scholarship program. So we looked at this uh, as a natural experiment and found that it boosted generic prescribing by a couple of percentage points, five to 10, depending on which drug it was. And so the health system was interested in this and we were we'd recommended some various ways that this could be a bit stronger. Eventually the health system implemented something um, which was um, we think even more powerful, which was regardless of whether you pick Coreg or Carvedilol, you can see again here, this physician's prescribing the same thing, but now Coreg is put in parentheses um, and Carvedilol is highlighted as the primary drug. Here's the confirmation page where you can type some instructions to the patient. They added this checkbox, dispense is written. Now keep in mind, this, text box, this checkbox was already on prescription pads for decades, but never made its way over in, into the electronic health record, at least this version um, of the electronic health record. And what would happen is if you click this, if you didn't click this box, whatever you prescribe would go to the pharmacy as generic. You, if you wanted the brand name prescription, you had to click check this box. It's really simple, easy to opt out of. And what we found is the generic prescribing rate, which was around, this is the, the top 75 drugs in the health system, was 75% overall basically shot up to 99% um, afterwards. The, the exception of one drug, which was levothyroxine um, or Synthroid. And that's a, an exception in which if you have 100 micrograms of the brand and the 100 micrograms of the generic, they actually have different materials in the coating of the tablet. And so you'll metabolize them differently. You actually get different thyroid hormones. So if you're a difficult to control hypothyroid patient and you're on Synthroid, the brand name prescription, and you move from California to Philadelphia, these are all new prescriptions, and you see your doctor, you should probably should stay on Synthroid. But what was happening was before the intervention, half of the patients were getting put on Synthroid when really only 20%, you see the opt-out rate is 20% here. And this is a nice example of where when things work really well, they work 
really well. And when the clinicians want to opt out, they can do so freely. And you see the clinicians are not really being tricked. Otherwise, you'd find that this would be 20%. And then once clinicians realize they have to test these patients multiple times, that this would drop further. This simple intervention took about an hour to implement. Over the, over, for just these 75 drugs over the time period I've shown here, this saved about $32 million of unnecessary spending, even if you account for conversion at the pharmacy, where the pharmacist will try to convince patients who have a brand name script to switch to generics. Even if you account for that, you save $32 million of unnecessary spending. So this was like a big eye-opening moment for the health system. Um, and this is, you know, there's evidence that patients who get generic prescriptions are more likely to adhere to them because they're more affordable. And obviously they have the same effectiveness as um, brand name prescriptions. And so it seemed like a win-win. And this is really the impetus for launching the nudge unit. Some projects that happened quickly after that, this is one led by Kit Delgado, looking at the size of the first opioid prescription and its link to chances of being, continuing to use opioids long-term. We know we're all going through an opioid epidemic. You know, if you come into the emergency department and you run all your blood pressure or diabetes medicine, you'll get a 30-day supply with the idea that you'll go to see your primary care doctor to get the rest. But if you come in and you have an ankle sprain or something else, and if you need opioids at all, um, you know, you probably shouldn't get 30 days with or 30 tablets with. And what was happening was as Penn was switching from an older electronic health record to Epic, th there was essentially no default. So the clinician had to type something in to now being a default of 30 tablets. So clinicians were, patients were essentially being defaulted to three times the average of what they should be getting, which is three to five day sample, um, which is about 10 tablets. And so only 21% of patients were being put on guideline concordant opioid prescribing. And so the question arose, okay, what do we have to do to change this? Do we need to get an epic analyst? Is this gonna be in some long queue? And what we realized was that the emergency department actually had the administrative tools to change this on their own. They just had to go into each of the drugs and then change the default. It's actually a function that's in epic, uh, but someone's got access. Um, and they did this and this essentially doubled guideline concordant opioid prescribing. And this is probably an underestimate because a lot of, there's been a lot of other constraints on opioid prescribing. Um, and they also defaulted ibuprofen and um, Tylenol. So when you search for let's say oxycodone, you're reminded that you could either prescribe the ibuprofen and Tylenol instead or with um, a, a narcotic to reduce the, the amount of narcotic that you give to patients. Next example is from Radiation Oncology. This is a project brought to us by Justin Beckelman and Sonam Sharma, who was a fellow at the time. National guidelines recommend that palliative cancer patients who are at the end of life don't receive imaging to align radiation therapy. So let me explain that with the opposite case, which is, let's say you have a patient who has liver cancer um, and you think that this can be cured. Um, you would wanna make sure that the dangerous radiation is targeted exactly to the liver cancer and not to the other healthy liver tissue, because that could result in bad outcomes 10, 20, 30 years from now. But in these patients who are gonna live days, weeks, maybe months, um, there's a lot of evidence to show that's not necessary because the benefits are much more further into the future. And there are other ways that we can align radiation without having to do daily x-rays or CT scans. But uh, so the guidelines actually recommend that they do, you don't do any daily imaging in these patients. Um, and many insurance companies no longer pay with this and pay for this. And so many of these patients who get daily imaging, their families get hit with the bill after they pass away. Um, and so what happens is, here, in, what was happening was 80% of patients at PEMS and were receiving daily imaging. This meant if you were had 14 days of rate, um, radiation, you could get 14 CT scans, none of which are covered by some insurances. Um, and so they said, okay, let's, why don't we implement uh, a nudge right when clinicians are ordering this to remind them how expensive um, this is, that a CT scan costs $3,286 or whatever it is. Um, we said, okay, let's think about that. You know, clinicians know that these tests are expensive. So that's not new information. It might remind them like at the right time. Over time, it's gonna get numb because they're gonna see the same intervention over and over. And then we wonder if cost is really the issue here. Is the, is the problem really that clinicians don't know that CT scans are expensive or there's something else going on? This is commonly what happens. We, we, we do these crowdsourcing tournaments for um, nudges, which is where we got this and the last idea and people will come with solutions. What we're really looking for is problems, and then we want to understand what behaviors are driving those problems. So what we found here, we said, let's look at the data, or let's look at what clinicians are doing, and try to understand what the issue is, and see if we can address that first. And so what we found is this is the template for ordering palliative um, cancer screening. And so the first thing, palliative radiation therapy, and what, first thing you'll notice is this is like the first half of like a three or four page document. So there are a lot of fields. Clinicians are really blowing through this pretty quickly, checking things. The other thing we realized was this was copied from the curative intent template. So it's not surprising that clinicians are ordering the same thing for palliative cancer patients as they are for other types of patients. 
you can see here um, cone B and C and T daily are like the first options that are listed here when the clinician drops this down. So if you click the drop down and you just are moving through, you're going to automatically order a CT scan daily. And so we said this is really a good target rather than putting the price right here next to cone beam CT, why don't we instead change the default to no imaging, which is in line with guidelines um, and in the best interest of, of patients. And so then questions came up, do we need an Epic analyst? Turns out this is not Epic. This is a system called Aria, um, which is a smaller shop. And then a lot of concern came about, well, how are we gonna get them to help out? Uh, and then what we realized was actually, this is just a Word document, which is embedded within the Aria platform. So actually to change this, all you have to do is right click on the button and then you get the drop down and you can go and click none and then hit the up arrow twice to move none to the top so that that becomes the default literally takes 15 seconds or less and is free um, just something that was overlooked for who knows how long and um, needed some strategic attention to figure out this was an opportunity so the department was doing a bunch of things they called this their quality improvement intervention of the year the, the, the uh, you know the chair of the department decided this was going to focus on Sonam and Justin were going around to each radiation oncologist and giving them feedback on their performance. Um, and so we wanted to figure out how do we understand that this is the intervention that drove the change as opposed to the educational efforts or the feedback to clinicians. And so the way we rolled this out was um, through a step wedge cluster randomized trial, which essentially we broke the practices into two groups, the university practices and the community practices. Um, and then Sonam literally flipped the coin um, to decide who would go first. Um, so here's the data before the intervention. The university practices shown in uh, blue, the community practices shown in orange. This is all before. You can see here that the rate of um, unnecessary imaging is 80% to start, and it does drift down 65, 70%, probably with the educational efforts and the feedback to clinicians. But the target here is about 20 to 25%. There's about one in four, one in five cases where a patient has a complex cancer or is morbidly obese or something else that clinicians say requires them to get imaging despite the guidelines. And so we randomized and the university practices were randomized to go first. And you can see they dropped significantly from 65% to almost where we wanted, 26, 27%. You can see that there, there was some spillover effect. This was a three month period. So these community practices are meeting with these every month and they learn about the great outcomes here and there's some spillover here. But then when we turn it on at the community practices, they drop further. So this essentially dropped the daily unnecessary imaging rate from 68% to 32%. And over the course of the year, 3,000 less imaging tests were conducted. Um, really, if you think about it, just changing the default, really cost-free, simple way to do this. What we also found, which we didn't um, actually realize until we started analyzing data, was that these patient visits were moving 20% faster because patients didn't have to get imaging, go get imaging, have that read by a radiation oncologist, have it change the treatment plan, um, which meant that these patients could be moved out 20% faster and you might be able to get many more patients in. So this more than over, overcame the loss and revenue that came from decreasing the, the reading of the imaging tests and is better aligned with patient outcomes. Um, check the time here. Any questions on that so far? I'm gonna maybe skip the next example and move to the patient examples. I don't see any questions in the chat. So why don't you keep going? Okay. We'll Maybe we'll talk about, the end. I'll talk about this active choice one um, really quickly because I've already talked about a bunch of default ones. So we talked about a bunch of default ones. Active choice we typically will use when it's not always clear um, what the right decision should be. And that could be because we don't have guidelines and we need a discussion. Or in the cases where there are guidelines, it could be because we can't identify the right patient from the electronic health record. Maybe the data is not there to tell us, let's say, what stage of cancer the patient has. That's not always recorded in the EHR. And so we can't target intervention, but we could prompt a, a discussion. Um, or in some cases, there may be other nuance. So uh, I'll talk about, so, so for example, I'm gonna talk about flu vaccination. An interesting um, thing with the law is that in, you know, clinicians need to order flu vaccination. And so those can't technically be ordered by a non-clinician. There are ways to set up standing orders, but anyways, a clinician needs to enter that order. And so we actually, instead of being able to default flu vaccination, we have to prompt someone to enter that order and then the clinician has to sign it. Whereas I practice over at the VA where patients will get the flu vaccine before, they're gonna offer the flu vaccine before they see me. Um, and then um, if they want it, they take it. If they don't, I get a message saying this patient declined and then I can talk to them. So here's an, that's an interesting case where the, because of that subtle law, which is in 13 states in the US, including Pennsylvania, 
um, we often have to use active choice instead of defaults. So I showed you that example from trip insurance already. Um, this is an alternative to making sure, making someone realize they need to make a decision. They have to stop and say yes or no. It has a bunch of design elements. You can prompt it when you have the physician's attention. You can increase the saliency of advantages or disadvantages, and you can make it easy to say yes. Specifically, when there are multiple orders that need to be entered, let's say you need to enter a diagnosis and a test and maybe something else. So for colon cancer screening, you might need to order, you might need to put in, maybe it's a diagnosis or, or a, um, the test and then also some prep. You can actually bundle those all together so you can just click yes and those orders will all get put into the electronic health record. Another example from this is from Domino's. They've been on the forefront and very vocal about using behavioral science. So let's say you're ordering pizza. They know that you're hungry. Um, so they prompt you, do you want the chocolate lava crunch cake? Um, why else would you be ordering pizza unless you were hungry and they, they've noticed that you haven't added dessert? And if you can see the chocolate oozing out of the chocolate lava crunch cake, um, they say no or yes. And the idea here is that people feel this sense of um, what's called anticipated regret. They anticipate the regret of finishing their pizza but not have ordered dessert. That prompts them to order, motivates them to um, take action uh, against the regret aversion, take action to avoid regret in, in this sense, order the chocolate lava crunch cake. Now, this is not just a static alert, right? If you've already ordered the chocolate lava crunch cake, it's going to prompt you to order breadsticks. If you've already ordered breadsticks, it's going to prompt you to order soda. I've actually gone through all the permutations of this. One of the last things it will ask you to order is a salad. It will get to the healthy choice at some point, but you've got to go through dessert, breadsticks, and soda first. Um, they've also changed this to a big green yes. And the only way to say no is to click the X, which doesn't appear for five seconds. So you've got to stare at this piece of cake for five seconds before you say no to it. Um, so let's see how it appears in Epic, not so pretty, um, but similar um, kind of principles. This is for flu vaccination. Um, this patient's eligible for the flu shot. Again, this doesn't go to everyone. If you've already been vaccinated or you're allergic, it won't fire. Um, this was implemented. You can either click yes or no. This was implemented to physicians and medical assistants in one practice on the corner of 37th and Market in 2012. Um, and at that time, the health system's flu vaccination rate was lower than the national average, and they wanted to do something about it. So they went to the, the medical director there and said, should we implement this alert to all primary care practices? And the medical director said, yes, you should definitely do that. Our vaccination rates have gone up. So they said, okay. And then they went to the, the floor above and below, and they asked those physicians, what do you think about this medical director on this floor? Do you think we should implement this intervention? And they said, well, our vaccination rates already went up last, also went up last year. How do you know it was the the intervention in the electronic health record that caused it. And this is a fundamental problem with many of these interventions that they're not often evaluated. Um, this was a project I did when I was a fellow is, which was to compare the intervention practice in blue to the control practice in orange. These are the two pre-intervention years. You can see they're almost, they're essentially identical. And then the post-intervention year, you can see that all the practices are right. The vaccination rate went up. It was actually a bad um, flu season. And so there was more attention to the flu vaccine that year but then it went up by more in the practice that had the alert using kind of a difference and difference approach. 6.6 6 percentage point increase or 37% relative increase. So with this, the health system said, let's implement this everywhere. And we said, before you do that, you should talk to the frontline clinicians who receive this um, alert because you've only talked to the, kind of the medical directors. And what they heard from the clinicians was that you absolutely cannot implement this in, in any other practices. And the reason was that there were actually 14 or 15 of these alerts that could fire breast cancer screening, colon cancer screening, diabetes management, weight loss discussions, all kinds of things. Sometimes you get like six of these alerts that would stack on top of each other at the beginning, right when you open the chart, it would fire to medical assistants who would enter an order and the clinician would get the alert before they would know if an order was entered. So they'd enter an order and now there would be two orders, all kinds of issues with how it was implemented. So we suggested, you know, you should, should expand it, but you should reduce the number of notifications, but every practice pick what their top three or four priorities are and just implement alerts for those, not for 14 or 15 things. And then redirect to just medical assistance. There's no reason that clinicians need to be um, exposed to these alerts. Medical assistants could be trained to, to accept the alerts when they're triaging or and getting the vitals of patients. Also prime the patients to let them know that an order for flu vaccine has been pended and they should talk to their doctor about it. Clinicians could then spend more time talking to patients who don't want the vaccine and just accept and assign the order for the patients who do. Um, so we evaluated this. Uh, Rebecca Kim, who's a primary, who's a resident right now, was a student at the time, led this evaluation. The intervention practices shown here before the intervention control practices here. You notice we're at 50% here, 
and we were at 25, 30% there. So we're actually doing much better. It's harder to move the needle when you're already here because there's some ceiling effect to vaccination. But nonetheless, the vaccination rate went up by nine and a half percentage points um, compared to control. And this is a, a version of this has now been rolled out to um, all primary care practices in the service line. About 5,000 more people we estimate get vaccinated each year because this has been implemented. Um, any questions on that? Maybe I'll just save the questions for the end now that we're getting close and, and talk through the patient focus nudges. Um, so I wanted to highlight two different examples of patient focus nudges. Some of these I've alluded to. Um, one is around a study that we're doing with the Behavior Change for Good Initiative. It's a mega study of flu vaccination nudges. And a lot of this could help to inform the COVID vaccine um, effort. Uh, a text message is delivered to patients, one to two text messages in a three days preceding a routine appointment with their primary care clinician. Um, this is delivered within the context of your appointment reminder. So if any of you had a primary care appointment, you'll get a reminder saying, just a reminder, you have an appointment with this doctor at this time on this date. Um, click yes to confirm or click no to cancel or reschedule. Did you know it's flu season or um, you should get the flu, various different nudges. They're actually at, at Penn Medicine and Geisinger, there are 19 different um, text messages that you could get. We also have a similar study with Walmart with the pharmacy chains, which has uh, 1.2 million people. Um, and there are slightly more, around 20 to 25 different types of nudges that they can get. Um, for these, um, we got approval from health system leadership, the privacy officer, because uh, specifically because we were texting patients. Um, which is done more commonly now in the, pan in the pandemic era, was done less before then. And we also got approval from the IRB, but it did not require informed consent. And the two main reasons for this were um, because it was um, something that generally applicable to everyone. So flu vaccination is something, it doesn't reveal anything about your medical conditions other than you're you know, over the age of 18 and you're not allergic to the flu vaccine. And because it's within the context of this appointment reminder um, that fit some of the rules around the the, the nuances with text messaging. Um, and so we did, we got a waiver of consent to be clear about this um, for, for informed consent. Um, here's an example of those messages. Um, so you get a sense of so the first one, um, Katie, this is a message from Penn Medicine by job upcoming appointment, text message and text and data rates apply, reply stop to opt out. So there's a way to stop. You have an appointment, blah, 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 on this date and this time. And then it's flu season, a vaccine is available for you, protect yourself. Look out for a reminder right before your appointment. This next message either comes 24 hours or 15 minutes before. We randomize patients to the time. Um, it says this is a reminder, and it says the flu vaccine has been reserved for you. That's the kind of like a key word in this message, as opposed to available, it's been reserved for you. Again, there are you know, various different versions of this. This one actually is a bit more interactive. It says it's flu season. Consider watching this two minute wellness video and answering two questions before your appointment. Um, and then also you're encouraged to get the flu shot. So the idea here is not that we're you know, telling you to get the flu shot, but we're telling you watch this video and then um, telling you that um, reminding you you're eligible for the flu shot. So these are two of you know, 19 different text messages that went up. It gives you a sense of the kind of things there that are being sent out. Now in contrast, we're right now doing a study for statin prescribing. This was supposed to launch in March, but was, or sorry, in April, but was delayed due to the pandemic and ended up launching in October. Um, there are four arms. I'm just going to talk mostly about the patient nudge, but I will briefly tell you about the other arms. Usual care is nothing. There are 28 practices in this trial. Seven are randomized to usual care. Uh, I shouldn't say it's nothing. We, we did work with the health system to implement statins in health maintenance, and we provided a decision tool for clinicians available in EPIC, and we also provided a decision tool for patients. That's in all arms of the study. There's a clinician nudge, which includes an active choice intervention to clinicians and a monthly peer comparison message that's sent through EPIC. There's a patient nudge, which is a notification on their statin eligibility right before the visit. This was changed from a letter to a text message. I'll show you that in the next slide. And then uh, one group gets both. This is, uh, allows us to understand the effect of the clinician nudges, the patient nudges, or the interaction between the two. So this was the letter to patients that was going to be sent out before the pandemic hit. Um, the idea was every week we get a list of patients who are coming in and we'd send them this letter. Um, this would not require any consent from patients. Part of, you know, one, you know, it's, it's being delivered through the existing, at least the standards of care. Patients get letters about things related to their condition all the time. Um, and so this was felt to um, be acceptable under a waiver of consent. We basically tell them you have an appointment so and then let them know they're eligible for a statin. It's based on guidelines. Um, 
primary care physicians prescribe statins like to patients like you as the standard of care. So defining it kind of like the default to the standard of care, what they do, and then some of the risks and benefits, and then having them fill out this active choice, kind of, yes, I'm interested or I'm unsure. And then um, please list the reasons you're unsure. Notice there's no way to say no here. The idea is either yes, you're interested or I I'm, I'm, have concerns and you list it out. You sign and date it and then you bring it in. So kind of gets you thinking about what um, about this before you come into your doctor. Waiver of consent. Now we switch, we're pandemic hits, our staff are not on campus. We want something that's more automated um, and also something that's kind of you know, up to date with the times. Now text messaging is being used more often. So we decided that we're gonna to switch to text messaging so that we can get this NIH funded trial off the ground before we run out of funding essentially. Um, and we switch essentially the same information, but it requires consent from the patient. I'm gonna show you on the next slide. Message from Penn Medicine about your appointment. We have an important message about your heart health for you to discuss with your doctor. Please reply why if you'd like to read this message or if you don't press stop. So because it's about their heart health and could reveal something about their condition, and because it's be through a text message, because of the text messaging laws, and because this is not usual practice through text messaging, um, the health system, the privacy office, and the, the may, not the IRB, importantly, the privacy office made us get um, consent from patients. Noting that text messaging is not 100% secure message and data rate supply, they also have to confirm this is them to make sure that we don't have the wrong phone number listed in here. We're not texting somebody. Um, you know, sometimes people type in a, the wrong phone number with a digit, or sometimes people change phone numbers, and we don't want to send them a message about Joe Smith to someone else um, who's not them. And if they say yes, then we proceed. Now, the challenge with this, you know, the trial is ongoing. Um, but we have looked about, um, you know, about 60% of patients just don't respond. So this is really only being only about 40% of patients are getting this message because the other 60% are either choosing either they're either saying no or they're just not responding to the, the text message. Whereas if we didn't have to get consent, we might have been able to push this out, but there are, there are obviously risks to that over text messaging. It's hard to know how many people are reading their mail. Um, you know, maybe what those rates are, we really can't track that. But just worth noting that here where we have some data, we know that 60% of people are not getting this, not getting the bottom half of this message where it walks them to the statin prescribing. So both of those two trials, the flu one and the statin one are currently ongoing. So I don't have results, but hope to report on those in the next couple of months. So in summary, um, as you've seen, medical decision making often suboptimal. The design of the environment influences our behavior. There are hidden nudges everywhere that we're not aware of. And so think of nudges are re really realigning the existing choice architecture with evidence-based guidelines by using some strategic attention. Um, and that nudge units are a group that can help to really think about ethical considerations, making sure that the pa patient outcomes are at the heart of this and, and helping to steer decisions towards higher value and better patient outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for getting in under under the wire. Um, if anyone has questions, please post them in the chat, and I can ask a couple just um, to get us to get us going. Mitesh, you had said pretty early on in the talk when you were talking about the types of things that you might want to pursue nudges for. You said some are kind of just not logistically set up for nudging, and then you said some you should not nudge. So since we have ethics folks on here, maybe you could talk a little bit more about what, from your perspective, would be something that you ought not to nudge. Yeah, so there's um, there's ones that you ought not to and ones that you just like can't. And so I'll give any, or, or it's not that easy to. So an example of an ought not to, or maybe not yet is we had one person come to us and say they had some, some um, guidelines on how we should be doing um, repletion of electrolytes or thinking about what types of, uh, whether we should be using normal saline or lactate ringers in different settings. Um, and that there, but that there had, there really weren't guidelines around that neither national guidelines or health system guidelines. I'm probably getting the exact um, example correct, but, but what, what the person was proposing, there wasn't evidence around what, what the consensus was for what was the right thing to do. And so what we recommended to them in the absence of national guidelines, we recommended they get um, support from their division leadership and that there are health system guidelines that will be formed. And sometimes that happens. So like for in antibiotics, so for example, antibiotics, there's an antibiotic stewardship committee that will create health system focused guidelines. And then we'll follow those and implement nudges along with those. But we tend not to implement nudges if we don't have um, consensus on guidelines, of, uh, buy in from leadership. Um, and then also now we include frontline clinicians need to be a part of designing the nudge. We didn't do that in the beginning. And um, we learned very quickly that that was a key part to implementing a, su a successful nudge. The other areas where we can't nudge things are people will say, well, can we nudge 
to reduce some, you know, readmissions to the hospital. It's like, you know, we need a specific thing that we can target. There are multiple things that go on there. Oftentimes those things are things that happen outside of the health system. There could be a specific thing, like let's try to nudge people to make a primary care appointment before they leave or try to nudge people to go to their primary care appointment, which we know is associated with that. But something so big as just hospital readmissions is, is not the right target for a nudge. You need to find a kind of a specific decision point and focus on that. Okay, let me ask just one more question before we close, which is what's your single most surprising result in your years of, of implementing these nudges? Something that really didn't work that you thought would or something that worked wildly better than you expected perhaps? Yeah, well, I talked about the generic prescribing one. I think that's the, that's the one that was like the eye opener. I guess nobody really expected that. You know, it took two years for that to unfold. You know, I went over the slide in like a minute, but you know, from the time that um, we thought about it and you know, where the health system really wanted to do it and their leadership buy-in from the top levels had, had put this as a priority, but it was actually almost like snuck in as a part of another rollout. And the way it came to us was we, one of the analysts in one of the divisions said, hey, our opioid prescribing rate went from generic prescribing rate shot up through the roof. How did this happen? And, and kind of revealed that this had been snuck in kind of under the radar, not that people didn't want to do it or hadn't kind of commissioned it to happen, but that the timing wasn't aligned. And so part of the goal of the nudge unit was to like take these ideas that are low hanging fruit and kind of try to get them implemented from idea to six months, as opposed to like these things happening a bit, a bit more haphazardly. Well, great. We're at time. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. And I hope those of you who are new to reps will join us uh, for our session next month. We hold these on the first Monday, typically first Monday, not in January, um, but the rest of the sessions will be first Mondays at noon. Thank you.